Welcome to the 2017 uh, Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting and the rollout of the 2016 National Beef Quality Audit. I'm Craig Uden, President of NCBA, a Nebraska cow calf producer and feedlot owner. This is the sixth time the National Quality Beef Audit has been conducted by NCBA as a contractor to the beef checkoff, and we are proud to have led the way on all six audits, beginning clear back in 1991 which doesn't seem that long ago. Uh, over the years, learning from the audit has led to significant improvements in the way we raise cattle and how we deliver a better product to consumers. As the industry, we have picked up most of the low-hanging fruit 20 years ago, but you'll see for the most current audit that we continue to make improvements, and there's still more work to be done. <clears throat> I've had the privilege of working on this, I believe, three times. And it always amazes me how much progress we have made. And truly, as I go out through the industry and I buy calves and I get to go watch operations and, and view things, it, it is, uh, we, there's definitely a difference in the country today. The quality of the cattle, the health of the cattle, and uh, just the genetic and, and management improvements that have been made in the industry. Uh, there's, there's a reason we have 80% grading cattle as an industry. There's a reason that we have virtually no residue. There's, the, it does make a difference because not only the work gets done here, but through this kind of collaborated effort, uh, the work gets disseminated out back to the country. And that's what I'm most proud of. And as we've talked about before, we have got a lot of low hanging fruit out of the way. And now we have other issues that get a little more dicey and a little more, a little more uh, interesting on how to explain to uh, producers out there to how we're going to address those issues in the future. Some people have got the basics, and that's a good point. But as we look at other the other aspects of, of the industry and how we deal with sustainability and continuous improvement, the challenges that we have from the consumer of how and, and how we raise our product and what technologies we do and don't use, it's vitally important we stay engaged and keep moving the industry forward. So that's my little spiel for this morning. Now I'll hand it over to Josh White, Executive Director of Producer Ed Education with NCBA to uh, provide the details on the presentation today. Josh? Thanks, Greg. Thank All right. So just to give you a quick rundown of the uh, schedule, since we didn't provide you with a program this morning, uh, I'll echo Craig's thanks as well. Thanks for getting up early and joining us. I think you'll find this uh, information extremely interesting and uh, beneficial for your operation or, or your company. Um, we're going to kick off with Dr. Belk, and I'll give full introductions of these folks in just a moment with some background information about the history of the quality audit and the process that we've gone through uh, clear back to 91, as Craig mentioned, and then he'll also cover face-to-face -face interviews. Then Dr. Sable, assisted by uh, Clay Eastwood, one of the lead uh, researchers in his team, will talk about the implant data. And Deb Van Overbeck will, uh, will wrap up with our strategy workshop and, and uh, sort of bring everything together. And then we'll follow that with some Q&A. So I did want to point out, you'll see some information scattered around. We put out the four-pager summary of the, executives, uh, of the larger executive summary for you on the tables. We also... Um, have a note card there, so an index card. So if you would like, if you don't want to get up on a mic, but you want to get a question in, feel free during the presentation to write that down on an in index card so it's ready to go when we get to Q&A. The other option is just shoot me an email. Uh, I've got service in this building, thankfully. And so you can shoot me an email with a question. Just put MBQA in the subject line, and I'll gather up those questions, and I'll be moderating out the questions at the end. The other option is we will have some roving mics, and you can stand up and ask a question at, toward the end. Depending on how much time we have, we'll do as much of that as we can. So with that, I'm going to do uh, a quick introduction of all of our speakers, so we won't be interrupting the speakers once we get going, and uh, then we'll get on our way. So I'm going to do this in reverse order and uh, end with Dr. Belk, who will be our first presenter. So Dr. Deb Van Overbeck uh, has a Bachelor of Science in Animal Science from University of Nebraska and a Master's of Science and PhD in Animal Science from Colorado State University. Uh, Deb joined the Department of Animal Sciences at Oklahoma State University in 2005. 
She's responsible for teaching undergraduate and graduate courses in animal sciences and currently serves as the interim assistant dean for academic programs for the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. Her research focuses on quality and sensory attributes related to beef cattle management and uh, she's participated in many of the national beef quality audits over the years. Um, Dr. Savel, Jeff Savel, is a university distinguished pr professor, Regents Professor E.M. Manny Rosenthal chairholder and the leader of the meat science section in the Department of Animal Sciences at Texas A&M University. In addition, he holds an appointment on the Faculty of Food Science and Technology. He's, he's done all of his education at Texas A&M, makes that real simple to read. Um, he's taught over 9,000 Aggies since 1982, has chaired and, or co-chaired over 130 graduate students who have become leaders in academia, industry, and government. Dr. Savel's awards and industry service highlights are too many to list, but I uh, do want to point out that he has been a key research partner for all six of our steer and heifer national beef quality audits all the way back to 91. Uh, Clay Eastwood will be assisting Dr. Savel in the uh, implant data rollout. She is um, going to present the harvest data. She is from New Brownfields, Texas, received both her bachelor's and master's degree in animal science from A&M and hopes to finish her PhD uh, by around May of next year, focusing on fresh meat quality and food safety under the guidance of Dr. Savel and Dr. Carrie Gehring in the meat science section at A&M. After completing her PhD, she plans to pursue a career that bridges U.S. and international meat and livestock industries. And then Dr. Belk, uh, Dr. Keith Belk, is a professor and holder of the Ken and Myra Montford Endowed Chair in Meat Science with the Center for Meat Safety and Quality, Department of Animal Sciences, and professor in the Colorado School of Public Health at Colorado State University. He earned his BS and MS at uh, CSU and a PhD from Texas A&M. He uh, worked briefly in the private sector early on as a buyer for Safeway and, buy, and then worked for USD Ag Marketing Service in Washington, D.C. as an international marketing specialist before joining CSU faculty in 1995. He has co-authored or authored 206 refereed scientific journal articles, over 740 total publications, generated over 19 million in external funding for research at CSU and is primary inventor on two patents. Again, too many... Uh, awards and association leadership roles to list here, but uh, definitely recognized internationally as a leader in meat science research. So Dr. Belk, if you'll come on up, we'll hand it over to you. We'll get this show rolling. If y'all will, welcome Dr. Belk to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear okay? I want to start out this morning by thanking and expressing my appreciation to the rest of the research team that we worked with on this project. Um, I started my role with the National Beef Quality Audit in 1991 as a graduate student, so that may tell you something about how far we've come. But uh, this last audit that we've just completed with this entire team, including Josh and staff at NCBA, has been really one of the, the best. And uh, I think you're really going to see that there was a lot of effort expended on this audit and we've, um, we've learned some very valuable things, I hope. I wanna talk to you just for a minute about the role of the National Beef Quality Audit and a little bit about how it be came to be. Um, many of you will, will remember that post or pre-1990, uh, we were having a bit of difficulty in the beef industry. Our per capita market consumption in the United States was declining. Prices were declining. Uh, it was tough. And uh, so starting in about 1990, uh, several people, including Dr. Daryl Wilkes and Chuck Lambert, who at that time worked for NCA, they recognized the opportunity to perhaps implement a new philosophy of manufacturing in the beef cattle industry. And that, man, that philosophy of manufacturing was based on the work of W. Edwards Deming. Dr. Deming was a statistician and mathematician who had been sent to Japan following World War II to uh, develop their, reestablish their commercial um, and economic <coughs> business lines. Dr. Deming always said that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And so the idea behind his philosophy was you collect data, you analyze it, and then you make production adjustments based on those data to assist. Dr. Deming's background was actually based on learning from uh, Dr. Walter Schuert. 
who was the guy that actually invented the concept of statistical process control, who many of you have, have read about in the past. Dr. Deming, being a mathematician, uh, thought that the mathematics behind the idea of statistical process control were very useful in terms of identifying places where production efficiencies could be added to the system, and so he adopted those into his philosophy. In 1946, then, Douglas MacArthur took him to Japan, and that's where he began the process of rebuilding the commercial industry and the economics in Japan. Uh, basically, they experienced in the Japanese economy about 10% growth between 1952 and 1970. The point being that because of his philosophies, their businesses became more efficient. They produced products that garnered more satisfaction with consumers based on the do per dollar spent. And as a consequence, the manufacturers in Japan captured market share all around the world. That included in the United States, where many of you are familiar now with Toyota. Toyota didn't have any market share in the United States prior to the mid-1970s, but now is the largest automotive manufacturer in the world. And it was due in part largely to uh, the, the teachings of Dr. Deming in Japan after World War II. As a consequence, Ford Motor Company adopted his teachings as well. And that's where some of you will remember the idea behind Ford is Job Quality One came from. That's where that, that concept came from. Basically, Dr. Deming's philosophy goes like this. Steve Cornett summarized it, I thought, really nicely <clears throat> And when we did the first international beef quality audit. He said the idea behind Deming's main points is to qu control quality at every step. It's very similar to the idea of HACCP, if you're familiar with the food safety system. It's the idea that you identify at each point in the production chain things that you can do to prevent a quality defect from occurring rather than waiting out until the end of the chain to catch it after the product has already been manufactured. All of you probably could reach in your slacks at some point in your lifetime and pull out a little piece of paper that said inspected by number 12. That's the philosophy that we don't want to use in the beef cattle industry because that means that we're searching for quality defects after we've already put all the resources into manufacturing the product to begin with. What we'd like to do is prevent defects from occurring in the first place, and that was Dr. Deming's philosophy. In about 1990, uh, sorry, 1989, Chuck Lambert, who was then working for NCA, and a lot of you will remember Chuck, he developed a paper, he was an ag economist, and he developed a paper called Lost Opportunities in the Beef Industry. And that paper was based on this idea that perhaps we could start to think about incorporating Dr. Deming's philosophies into beef cattle production. Dr. Lambert showed that we were probably sacrificing, and remember this is in 1989 dollars, about $12 billion annually in lost revenue that was a consequence of basically quality defects being generated in the industry. That totaled to about $458 per head, and I think most of you would agree, particularly if you're in the cow-calf industry, that another $400 a head would be pretty attractive at multiple times. So the original rationale for the audit was to, the cattle industry cannot expect improvements in prices for its products or its byproducts when quality doesn't warrant incre those such increases. So the idea is, let's produce a product more efficiently with less inputs that is of greater quality that will satisfy more consumers per dollar that we charge them for the product and by that manner capture more market share, which will benefit the entire production chain. And so in 1991, we conducted the first national beef quality audit for fed and cattle and steers and heifers. And since then, as been mentioned a couple of times this morning um, by Craig and, and Josh, uh, this is now the sixth audit that's been conducted for fed cattle. My job to you this morning for this for you this morning is to report on the first part of the National Beef Quality Audit, which is the conduction of the face-to-face -face interviews portion of data collection. As many of you will know, this has evolved significantly from the manner in which it was conducted in 1991. Today, <clears throat> we use a much more sophisticated me mechanism for capturing data and information here. Uh, we use computer systems and we use 
uh, basically software that has the opportunity to change the questions depending on what the previous answer in the survey or the interview was. These are all conducted, as I said, for the most part, face-to-face. -face. And the reason they're conducted face-to-face -face is, as you all know, if I just ask somebody to check some boxes on a survey, I'm not really going to capture a whole lot of gut reaction about the, the issues associated with things. And so what we've tried to do is get in front of people and record everything that they say about, um, about things that are important to them relative to beef quality. In this study, we've conducted, uh, we, we interviewed 36 packers, 35 retailers, 29 food service chains, uh, further processors. We included 64 different companies, and then we evaluated or included in the, in the interviews 30 uh, peripheral government and trade organizations. This includes staff of NCBA, but it includes several government agencies, um, several allied trade associations, et cetera. So when you make the computations mathematically, what this means is we've asked companies in the packing industry that cover over 92% of all the beef slaughtered in the United States what they think about quality. So we've covered most of the, most of the industry. In the retail portion of the industry, we've covered about 55%. And in food service, we're right at 25%, probably closer to 30 or 35%, but we don't have real good numbers on that. The way that we do the interview portion of this study is we break the questions into seven categories or buckets as we call them sometimes. These buckets are basically um, seven things that you could say um, have, are associated with quality of the product as it is presented to you and your company. Um, we don't tell them what these buckets mean and in fact the first portion of the interview is for them to tell us what these buckets mean to them. And so some of the sectors of the industry define what these buckets mean differentially from each other. And so we have to take that into account then when we look at what they're saying at the end of the, the interview process. So what does this mean to your company? As I said, we asked them to identify each of these buckets. I'm not going to show you all of these definitions because it would just take too much time this morning. But I'm going to show you a couple just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So here is the definitions by sector, by market sector, for what food safety means to each of, of the companies. And you can see that across those various sectors of the supply chain, there's some variability in what that topic means to them. And what we've found by also interviewing and surveying in non-direct methodology producers, all of you, as we found that there's sometimes a disconnect between what, those, what this topic means between production and then your customers downstream in the production chain. Here's the same sort of definitions for eating satisfaction. And I'm showing you these two in particular because as you're going to see in a few min minutes, they are by far and away the two most important quality buckets to the industry post livestock production. One of our further processors said that eating satisfaction is paramount. All of the forks of the organization come down to customer satisfaction. It's what we hang our hat on relative to beef production. We'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. As part of this interview process, because we've made it more sophisticated in how the questions are asked, we're able to conduct what's called an economic study or a willingness to pay study. And I won't stand up here and tell you that I'm an ag economist because I'm clearly not. But the economists have worked with us and helped us to do this so that we've designed it appropriately relative to, to asking the kinds of questions that we're interested in answering. We break the questions in, really into two categories. The first question we ask them is, what things must the product have before you would buy it at all? In other words, what are the must-haves that are a requirement to do business with the supply chain to begin with? The second part of it is, is then once those must-haves are satisfied with product quality, or it could be something else, then would you be willing to pay more for additional things that we could add to the product by way of adding quality. So something goes something like this. A must-have is a non-negotiable quality factor that must be included in the purchasing agreement before the transaction can take place. 
So we give you an example. The product has to come from a USDA inspected facility before we can buy it, period. We can't buy it at any price if it doesn't meet that criteria. That's a must have. Then we ask questions, okay, beyond that, let's say we can provide that to you. Then what if, what could you do relative to pricing if, you were to, if we were to guarantee you these additional quality attributes? Those are the willingness to pay components of the study. So relative to must have, we're asking for the things that they're going to require in product attributes before they'll purchase the product at all. This is what those data looked at like in 2016. Basically, you'll notice that um, if you compare these, the first time we did this, used this methodology was in the 2011 audit, and you'll notice that the responses by most of the trade were very similar in terms of uh, things that they absolutely require before they'll make a purchase uh, as they were in, in 2011. Um, there's a couple differences, uh, for example, in the retail industry, some of the things that were important to them in 2011 declined in 2016. What that means then is something's going on relative to willingness to pay. So if this is our platform, these are the basic requirements to do business, then we have to have some things happening beyond that that are significant rel relative to willingness to pay. And that's what the, those data look like. The number of companies that were willing to pay more for quality attributes that we build into the production system actually increased between 2011 and 2016. So what that means for all of you is this is an opportunity to do things proactively in the industry to recapture value that is currently being thrown out in, and scattered to the wind. The downside to this is that if I look at how much they're willing to pay for those trades, so we have more people willing to pay for additional quality attributes, but they're willing to pay less than they were in 2011. And so that's the downside to what we've learned in this, in this study. So going forward, as we try and differentiate products, we're going to be looking to add tangible quality characteristics to those products that differentiate one branded program from another branded program. More people are going to be w willing to pay more premiums for that product, but they're not going to be willing to pay as much premium for that product as they have in the past. And so we're starting probably to meet our saturation point relative to product differentiation. The second part of the interview process is to conduct what we call a relative importance, importance evaluation. This is a mathematical method by which you we're basically able to quantify responses relative to what's more important and what's less important relative to quality. Now keep in mind that we've allowed each market sector of the industry to define those seven quality buckets the way that they think that they should be defined. So whenever we look at these rankings, we have to look at them in the context of how each market sector defined each of those buckets. This is the way that looks like for steers and heifers. Um, basically, you'll see that for a great number of things, particularly food safety, there is a huge ranking, a huge differential in the ranking of basically two things here relative to what is important downstream in the production chain. And I know that we've struggled to try and figure out what to do about food safety on the pre-harvest level, but this is something that is increasingly audit after audit becoming more important to your customers. And so we've got to continue to, uh, we've done some great things relative to food safety. There's absolutely no question about it but it is still of significant business importance to your customers downstream. The other thing that's important, if you look at just the packing sector of the industry, what is most important to packers is the composition of the cattle to this day. Um, that's a little bit of a shift from 2011, but I think we all know that packers are still interested in lean fat and bone. They're interested in the proportion of edible product that comes out of an animal versus the proportion of less valuable product that is produced from the animal, and that will always be the case relative to their purchasing requirements. When you drop down then and look at the other industry sectors, though, that changes. The second most important thing to the rest of the industry is eating satisfaction. 
So what I mean by showing you this is let's not lose sight of the fact that eating satisfaction is still driving what's important to our customers downstream. It's what we do that's really, really good, and we need to make sure we continue to take advantage of it and maintain its relative importance uh, compared to other protein sources. When I start looking at what's ranked third across the differing market sectors, then things start to get a little hazier. Uh, each sector of the industry then starts to sort of differentiate themselves on things that are important specifically to their, their portion of the production chain. We asked the companies, does your company require your suppliers to source cattle raised using your life quality assurance programs? What we're interested in here, of course, is is it important to retailers and food service operators and everybody downstream that services consumers that we use, that we implement beef quality assurance upstream in the production chain? And we've had lots of conversations about this as we've evaluated these data, but if you think about it, we've done a pretty good job of telling each other about what we need to do that's right and wrong relative to beef quality assurance, but we haven't done a real good job of telling all our customers what we're doing that's right and what's wrong. And so as a consequence, when we asked people at retail and food service and the other levels of the production chain, what do you know about the quality assurance programs that have been implemented upstream, they don't really know a lot about them. You can see that only about 15 of the packers, 14 of the retailers, 8 of the food service operators, and 21 of the 64 processors understood that something was happening upstream that was an integral part of we care relative to producing the product. And so this is something we think we're going to have to do more with in the future. Relative to what's the image of your industry, the image of your industry is still very strong and part of the, the, the uh, production chain. So downstream in production towards the consumer, everybody believes that um, our image is strong. We, you all are doing a great job relative to maintaining your values and ethics and, and they think that that's important. And if you look across there, you'll see that that's true across all the sectors of the production chain. Relative to strengths, the industry believes that our strength, as I've just mentioned and discussed, is still the quality. And what they meant by quality here was the eating satisfaction component of beef. Um, we need to make sure that we maintain that. That's still important to them. Remember that more, more and more often, though, we're having to do that with food safety being a requirement of purchase as well. So product quality is the number one response across the board. A couple, one of the packers said to us, the product is what's important. Even though it really is high-priced, people still love it, and so... We're producing a higher priced consumer product. It obviously has to have some satisfaction characteristics associated with it for them to warrant that expenditure. And so it appears to us like we're still doing that and we're doing a good job of it. The ability to supply a wholesome product, no other beef compares to US beef. We need to use our food safety systems all the way back into livestock production and capture value from that in the production chain. What are the weaknesses of the industry? Um, these slides probably are not going to do real justice to this, and so I want to hone in on this just for a moment. If you look across there, every one of the market sectors of the industry, either in first place ranking or second place ranking, made comments about how good a job we're doing marketing our product. They're not saying that we're not promoting our product here. That's not what they mean. What they mean is we're not telling consumers what we're doing that's right relative to their product. There, we have a consumer base that has become disengaged and disenfranchised from livestock production. And so we have got to take the reins and be more aggressive in helping consumers understand what we do and how we do it correctly. This, this goes hand in hand with the findings before that says that we're not doing a good job of marketing our BQA program downstream in the production system. Someone's making a lot of money while someone else is losing a lot of money in the industry. We still have some disconnects relative to communicating financially among the industry sectors. So 
sorry, I went the wrong way. And then they said that we don't communicate well enough. It's difficult to make changes when we have an island mentality among the various sectors of the production chain. So we have to work together more aggressively to overcome. We're facing a war. I'm going to show you the last slide here. These are the threats that the companies felt like we're facing going forward to the industry. You'll notice that public perception is the number one component there relative to the sectors of the industry that are closest to the consumer. So what this means is we're fighting a war, everybody. We've got to be more aggressive in addressing this disenfranchisement with our consumers. We have to figure out ways. This is going to require some creativeness, some new ways of thinking. We're going to have to do things differently, seriously, if we're going to address this problem. But it is the number one issue facing us moving forward as a threat. We need to figure out how to make consumers part of our production system again. And that's what the comments from each sector of the industry told us. There's a big distrust sometimes for big business, and for whatever reason, um, consumers have sometimes expressed a distrust in our production system. So if you'll look at the four-pager that you have in front of you, it basically summarizes a ranking overall of where the quality buckets ended up um, standing for 2016. We've contrasted that with the audits that were conducted in 1991 and 2005. Of course, the audits have changed dramatically over that period of time. So I'd be careful about reading too much into this. But I do want to point out to you that some of the things that were identified on the top 10 list in 1991, they've went away. So as everybody this morning has already said, we are making progress in improving beef quality. And this is going to have a value component to your business as we move forward in beef production. Second thing I want to point out is just like in 2011, the two most important quality attributes were food safety, which most of us in meat science don't think about as being quality, and then secondly, eating satisfaction. And they were, that, they were in that ranking by a long ways. And so we need to make sure that we continue to ensure those two things are delivered to all of our customers downstream and ultimately to the consumers. Last thing I'm supposed to talk about is the consumer, I'm sorry, the producer survey that we conducted. This is an aided online survey that many of you were asked to fill out a survey on. Uh, it was just a thing where you logged into the web website and, and filled out, answered some specific questions. Um, they weren't leading questions, but it was, it was, you were aided in how you answered the questions. Basically, the pie graph up there represents the, the numbers of producers that responded to this survey. We had a total of 809 respondents, and we thought that was a pretty good um, response pattern relative to, to basically doing that over a short period of time. These are the, the responses from all of you relative to what you thought was important and how you defined each of those quality buckets that I uh, demonstrated for you earlier. So relative to how and where cattle were being raised, you thought that it was animal well-being, it was traceability, and it was health. That doesn't necessarily conform with what the downstream sectors of the industry thought. The one I want to point out really clearly to you, it says food safety, if you see about midway down the slide, it talks about how all of you define food safety. And you said basically that it's BQA, it's no violative residues, and it's biosecurity. And although I don't disagree that any of those things are hugely important, that's not how the question was answered by all the sectors that were downstream. And in fact, when we did a cardinal ranking, just like we did of all of the interview responses, of your responses to the survey, this is what those data ended up looking like. You ended up ranking number one, the weight and size of cattle as being the most important thing. You basically said that food safety was second, and then you had cattle genetics ranking third, and cattle genetics was ranked over technically eating satisfaction. And so that's a bit of a problem. What that demonstrates is that we have a disconnect. 
Whatever economic signals are being sent back upstream to you as producers is not really conforming with what the customers downstream are saying are important to them. And so somehow we got to figure out how to fix this because the signal is going to be the incentive for what the changes are for the next five years. And if the signal's wrong, then we're not going to make the right changes before we get to the next National Beef Quality Audit. And so uh, we need to figure out moving forward how to correct this disconnect bef between producers and between the rest of the production chain. And when I say producers there, I'm including all of the sectors of production. Basically, this is the way that you uh, told us that you had made changes during the last five years since the 2011 audit. Uh, most of you added improved record keeping systems. Uh, a lot of people adopt BQA. Congratulations on that. That's awesome. We're rooting for it. Um, upgrading facilities. Those are all excellent things, and, we, and those are the things we're talking about that will make progress towards the next audit. We just got to make sure that we're addressing the right objectives when we make those changes so that we're doing the things that are important to the customers downstream. Our conclusions from this first part of the study is that branded beef program use has increased. Um, I didn't show that in the data, but the use of branded beef programs has increased. You'll see numbers on that in a moment. Um, we think that that's in part to better differentiation of more diverse qualities in the product, but we also think that it's become a mechanism to deal with um, what has become increasingly large carcass weights and inconsistency in sizes. And so they're using brands to differentiate and break up the population to hit targets to address those problems downstream. The sectors don't understand cattle genetics to improve beef quality. All of you think that we're going to use selection, genetic selection, maybe some molecular characteristics moving forward to make improvement genetically in what we provide to consumers. The customers don't know what that is. And so we have to do maybe more to help understand what we're doing upstream again to help them understand what genetics are downstream. There's the consistency and size and weight issue is a big problem that we continue to face. And again, we think that they're addressing it with branded beef programs. Food safety dominated all of our conclusions. Um, food safety is the bottom line when it comes to willingness to pay. And so we've got to continue to work on food safety as an important aspect of production. Although companies are listing portions of the BQA as important to their businesses, they're not specifically citing that you all try to do the right thing when they when answer questions about um, that are directly targeted towards quality assurance programs and livestock production. So what that told us, we think from this audit, is we need to start marketing and telling people more about what we do in livestock production so that retailers and food service operators and all those people that work in restaurants around the United States understand that all of you actually do care. You've implemented beef quality assurance programs. We're trying to get better all the time. And uh, we just need to tell them that we're doing that. 